Hi, <clears throat> welcome everyone. I'm Jamie Betcher with the Aspen Business and Society Program. On behalf of the entire team at Aspen Institute, welcome to this very special conversation and celebration today. As many of you already know, the mission here at the Business and Society Program is to align business decisions with the long-term health of society, which is a mission that we feel is ever more critical in today's, amidst today's headlines. Um, we are a team of optimists here, so we hope that the events of 2020, as challenging as they are, they also offer a chance for a reset in business norms and the trajectory of capitalism. But sometimes it's really hard to see how that might happen. We believe there is extraordinary power in the individual business choices. And so we've crafted today's agenda to delve into both what is needed from leaders and their choices now and in the future. We're thrilled to have Dan Schulman, CEO of PayPal with us today and Kerwin Charles, Dean of the Yale School of Management. And we'll be talking about leadership in this moment. We're importantly talking about also the pipeline of talent and students and how next generation business leaders are being equipped to make decisions in their careers that support a flourishing and inclusive society. So with that being said, it is my great honor to open today with a reveal of our 2020 Ideas for Teaching Award winners. These are faculty, business school faculty, they're teaching at the vanguard of management education to prepare students and the next generation of leaders for those business choices. These are chosen from over 100 nominations from all over the world, and they're chosen for the questions they tackle and the pedagogies that they use all of which we believe point to the very choices that business can make for a better world. Um, after the conversation that we'll have with Dan and Kerwin, we'll have a chance to hear more from these faculty winners um, and hear about the courses that they teach. Um, but because I know the anticipation has been building, so without any further ado, I'm gonna kick off the event today with a quick announcement of the winners. All right, here we go. I'm gonna announce an alphabetical order of the courses and uh, I'm gonna queue up our very own in-house business and society symphony orchestra. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Impact Studio, translating research into practice. Corporate diplomacy, aligning stakeholder analytics and strategy. Ethics, Responsibility, and Sustainability. Next winner is Ethics, Value-Based Leadership for Cosmopolitans. Future of Work. Organizing in Times of Crisis, the Case of COVID-19. Resource Allocation in Organizations. Seminar in Business and Society. And last but not least, the 360 degree corporation. So we are thrilled to congratulate the innovative faculty teaching these courses and we'll hear a bit more from the faculty and how they're preparing students in just a bit. But now it is my great pleasure to turn the floor over to our executive director, Judy Samuelson. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thanks for this quick preview of coming attractions. And let me add my own congratulations to these remarkable scholars whose teaching I would say is aimed at the managers we need for tomorrow and for today. At the Aspen Business and Society Program, we work at the intersection in some respects of both theory, classroom and practice, boardrooms and executives. We work to influence both the mindset and in some ways the machinery of capitalism. They both matter. Yesterday, we happened to host a book talk for Roger Martin, the business strategist and former Dean of the Rotman School at the University of Toronto. And he spoke about the need to revive general management, which I, I think by he means the kind of the responsibility for all the facets and impacts of the business over its long-term success, rather than the single objective function that Milton Friedman so proudly proclaimed exactly 50 years ago this week. Yet we know we still have a long way to go and to ensure that we make this room for this kind of teaching and research is the purpose of this awards program. But to help us unpack the change a bit more that's needed in both business and the business ecosystem, 
We have been two incredible leaders and provocative thinkers that I'm pleased to introduce now. Dean Kerwin Charles of the Yale School of Management and Dan Schulman, the CEO of PayPal. I'm honored to be with them for the next 40 minutes. My colleague will put their bios in the chat, but let me just share a couple of facts and get us started off. Dean Charles is a PhD economist. His bio talks about his research on earnings and wealth inequality, conspicuous consumption, race and gender and labor market discrimination. Before moving to Yale, where he was recruited to join a year ago, he held leadership positions in two policy schools, one at the U Chicago and before that at Michigan. Full disclosure, Yale SOM is my own alma mater and I have great, 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 great affection for the institution. And I heard you speak, um, Kerwin, if I may call you that, I heard you speak at the Meet the Alumni Tour in New York when you were first uh, joining the team at Yale. And I know that you were keen to move to a business school precisely, I think, because of the conversation we're trying to have today about the opportunity to really move the needle on critical needs for which the business sector is uniquely suited and has real agency. And Dan Schulman is hardly new to these questions. He has decades of experience in service industries from telecom to financial services, AT&T to Amex. And he became CEO of PayPal at the time that the company was spun off from eBay in 2014. Again, we're honored to have you both in our virtual classroom today, which by the way, recently swelled by hundreds yesterday when Yale posted this opportunity on the admissions office site. So suffice to say, we're speaking today to the next generation of leaders and managers and influencers of business and the professional services. So our time is short and I'm gonna move us through several kind of domains of interest and I'll try to keep us moving. But I'd say this conversation is really about choices. The choices we have as leaders, the choices that reside within business, the role of business schools in illuminating those choices, and the complex work of institutional change. So, but I'd like to start, if I could, with your own professional choices. Why do each of you do the work you do? And is there, was there a point at which the direction became clear for you? Kerwin, can I start with you? Very well, thanks very much for having me, Judy. Um, so let me answer the question. There's a part of it that is sheer accident and serendipity. Uh, like for many people on the call, I would love to hear Dan's response. I, it is not the case that I knew 20 years ago, 15 years, 10 years ago, that this is the precise path I wanted to follow. That, as I say, one meets someone in a meeting, there's an accident that happens, and then you end up in a place like that. Having said that, there are aspects of choice here. And with respect to choice, um, I've long been of the view that the problems that by which the society is beset require for their resolution collaboration between business and other fundamental institutions in society. I don't care what the problem is. Whether we're talking about vaccination to deal with pandemics and pharmacology, whether we're talking about climate change and how firms will alter their production technologies, poverty alleviation and inequality, whatever the problem, there exists a role for business activity in helping to resolve it. And so the chance to take on a leadership role in a space business way, where I would be able to one, help shrink the distance between the ideas generated in schools and by researchers in an institution and their implementation in the business world. That's one thing it would, being Dean allows me to do. Second, it allows me to harness the research, the interest, the ideas of myriad scholars and not just me. There's a set of people whose work I'm surrounded by every day. And as Dean, I can help encourage, support and harness. And third, there's ability to help train the next generation of business leaders. There are few opportunities in the current professional landscape that give someone with my particular set of interests and abilities a leadership role and allows me to exercise or act upon all the areas just mentioned. And so serendipity, my experiences, people I met and so forth, turned me generally in this direction. My scholarly and other interests uh, and the things I've just summarized directed me, as it were, 
to take the job at Yale School of Management. That's what I would answer. Thank you and welcome. Dan, how about you? Um, thanks for the question, Judy and Kerwin. It's a pleasure to uh, be on this call with you as well uh, and an honor. Um, I fully agree with what Kerwin said. I think there are very few people who uh, from a very early age know exactly what they want to be and why they want to be that. Um, you know, and I think uh, I could never have imagined uh, being the CEO of any company when I first started uh, a long time ago with AT&T as a assistant account executive. Um, and, um, but you know, you meet people along the way. And I think one of the people who I met that most influenced me was uh, Richard Branson. And uh, Richard and I uh, started a company together, Virgin Mobile. And we spent a ton of time of thinking about um, what the purpose of business was and what the responsibility of leadership inside those businesses, um, how that would evolve uh, going forward. And could we think about business as being a, uh, a force for good in the world and that CEOs would have some kind of moral obligation to think about multiple constituencies. This was way before we would talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, Milton Friedman and, you know, thinking about multi-stakeholder capitalism. Um, and, um, and my career really then started to move to places where I thought I could have an impact, uh, make a difference in some way. PayPal gave me um, the opportunity uh, because we were spinning off from eBay and defining our own mission and a set of values uh, that we would embrace uh, to be competitive uh, in the world. And it was very interesting to me um, as I've gotten older to realize the mission of a company and the values around that mission are probably the most important things that a leader of a company um, has to develop and then take oftentimes courageous stands in um, assuring that those values are upheld and you stand up for them. So um, Dan, the point in your career where you started to make these connections between the inside and outside of the firm, you're saying that really happened as you were working with Richard Branson. Yeah. Um, so fast forward to a year ago, um, when the Business Roundtable, which for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a Washington lobbying organization and a, a network of leading chief executives of which Dan is the CEO of PayPal is one of the members. Um, the Business Roundtable reversed its own definition of corporate purpose, um, stating that the contemporary businesses needed to engage in a complex set of interests and needs and to be viable and resilient and pay, be attuned to, as they call it, stakeholders. Um, over this kind of Milton Friedman single objective function of profits or share price. That had run its course. The statement made headlines in the US and well beyond as a pretty radical reset of what is taught in business classrooms and is accepted and rewarded in many boardrooms. So Dan, I presume you are fully supportive of this restatement, but I'm gonna, would like to start off with a couple of questions with you and then see um, how Kerwin would respond as well. Um, first of all, is this really a new direction um, or was it easily endorsed by your peers as some of the press reported because they said we were already doing it? And if we're already doing it, are we getting the change that we would expect when we have a profound statement like that? Kind of, how do you think about that and this kind of challenge of kind of restoring public trust in business and these, the role of these institutions at this moment? I know that's a big question. I'm happy to have you take whatever corner of that question is most meaningful to you at PayPal and as a member of this network. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's an important question. Um, you know, I've been calling this uh, what I call reverse Friedmanism, um, where we're really rethinking um, the purpose uh, of a company. But I think even still today, um, 
many CEOs, maybe even many shareholders, um, think that there is some sort of dissonance between the profitability of a company and the purpose of a company. Um, and that you really, purpose stands over here and profits stand over here. And you know, if you're really thinking about being a purpose-driven company, by definition, you're gonna sub-optimize profitability. And um, my view is that purpose and profitability go hand in hand. It's a matter of time frame. Uh, more than anything else. In other words, I could probably maximize profits uh, more next quarter uh, by um, not paying my employees as much and that kind of thing. But, you know, the role, I think, of a CEO um, is to maximize uh, and create great enduring companies over the medium and long term. And I think at least for me, and this is a little controversial, you know, when I, I think about the constituencies that I serve, uh, and I serve shareholders, customers, the communities I live in, regulators, uh, and our employees, the number one constituency by far and away is our employees. And, you know, I think that we need to do everything to have both passionate, and financially healthy and financially secure employees. That is the foundation on which to build a great company. Because there's only, in my view, again, there's only one sustainable competitive advantage that a company has. Uh, it's not the amount of capital they have, it's not their business model. It is the caliber of the talent that they're able to attract into that company and retain in that company and the passion that that uh, employees have for advancing the mission of the company. And I would submit to you that the best talent wants to come to a company that has a purpose, that actually is trying to make a difference in some way in the world, and that has a set of values that they stand for, and that, um, that they're willing to publicly state those values and then take action against them. Like for instance, you know, the first big thing PayPal did is when North Carolina, like five years ago, passed House Bill 2, which in our reading of it allowed for the discrimination against people for sexual orientation or their sexual identity, we pulled out of North Carolina and it was massive headlines and it was lonely for a while. And I received multiple death threats uh, after doing that. But my view was that was like anathema to our values as a right. company, and we needed to stand up for it. And that, interestingly enough, was what really started to create this passion inside our employee base for who we are, and what we will do to stand up for uh, our values and the community that we uh, that we stand with. That's a great, very compelling example. Um, it's it's an interesting um, perspective that's often not thought about, which is in some respects, employees are more aligned with the company than anybody. I mean, your your future, the, the future of the company and the future for the employees, they're they're completely and totally, you know, they work so well together. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a great example. Um, Kerwin, I read an interview where you talked about Yale SOM's institutional power to ask things of employers, specifically around things like career ladders and glass ceilings, but it could go beyond that. I assume you're not gonna be challenging PayPal with that kind of a statement, but we have access to, your quote said, we have access to corridors of power that other ins institutions simply do not possess. And they must be deployed for this mo most important of social goods. And I think you are referring to the greater opportunities that are needed for equity and opportunity cutting across race and gender and class. At least that was my interpretation of the context in which you said this. So I'm kind of curious about your own general reaction to the changes afoot in business that Dan spoke about and then spoke about directly about PayPal, but kind of 
our business, like what's your general reaction to that? And then what's your sense of business school classrooms and whether or not they're keeping pace with the changes that are happening in business? Again, big question, whatever piece of this strikes you as most interesting or compelling or you're thinking the most about is what we'd love to hear. I would begin with, uh, I wanna to touch briefly on Dan's response to the earlier question about the trade-off, the presumed trade-off between, between profit, pecuniary success and well-being and strength of a company and its values and mission. And so I wanna make two points about that. One point is that with respect to Friedman's original framing, right, there is a sense in which we, and I mean we scholars and the popular community have characterized it. Uh, he himself, I suspect, was framing it as a kind of caricature. Here's what I mean, that there is a sense in which every business always must be attentive to things like whether its, its customers are perturbed by its uh, violations of environmental policy, yeah? or whether in the catching of the seafood it wishes to sell, it harms sea turtles, which thing would have an effect of lowering consumer demand and adversely affecting profit, whether its employees believe that pay is transparent and fairly determined, yes? And so even before the business roundtable made the statement and before and after Friedman's statement, consideration of how other, consider of other matters besides the purely top line measure of business yeah, meant that corporations had to contemplate, business has had to contemplate these other considerations, these other factors that feed into the pecuniary bottom line. That's the first one. The second point though, is that having so done, we come to a place where, a place where there may well be a genuine trade-off between profit and business, profit and value. The example Dan just shared about PayPal's pulling out of North Carolina may have been such a point. There will be points when the firm, mom and pop shop, Fortune 500 company, whatever, may have to, at the margin, sacrifice profit in the furtherance of some other more important or equally important social good. I think this is something we need to keep clear in our mind. We want to understand that business leaders need support. They need uh, a certain language for describing to their shareholders, to their coworkers, why that kind of trade-off is being made. But uh, let me begin by saying that. You ask, uh, you made reference to the comment I made about the access that places like the Yale School of Management have to corridors of powers, I think what I said. And you are right. When I made that statement, I was referring to the opening up of access, the getting firms to revisit uh, their hiring practices and policies, for example. But I actually meant the statement or the statement could be read much more generally because there's a sense in which um, situated as I am in a school of management, which school is housed in a great university, research ideas and facts come to my attention much more quickly than is true of someone running an important business in name the sector. Yeah. My exposure to those ideas, a week, a month, maybe a year before they become properly widely known, demands of me and of us as leaders engaged in business school training, demands of me uh, that I expose business leaders to them quite quickly. Um, and it, all, it demands too, this training that we're doing here, that I listen to ideas and facts and new initiatives and so forth that are emerging in the business world that come to me late, you see. And so what exactly should I be teaching my students about AI, for example, is something that people in Dan's space will have greater knowledge about, maybe even years head start relative to me. What I wanted, and maybe should have more clearly said in the statement you quote, 
is that there needs to be an ongoing symbiotic engagement between people training institutions, training the next generations of leaders and activists and participants in the business fair and persons engaged in the activity now. Yeah? There is mutually beneficial conversation and exchange that needs to go on. The final part of your comment was about the classroom and examining the classroom and reflecting upon the changes that I think this moment demands of us. How are we doing? Yeah. How are we doing? I believe that on balance, we're doing incredibly well. The world is much more technical in some ways than was true 20 years ago. Our students require greater knowledge and experience and exposure to data analytics, for example, to computer programming and other things. And so we do well at, we, we must provide to our students that kind of technical competence. But it's also true that in every business school I know of, every one, more and more time is atten and attention uh, being paid to the matter of how we train our students to live easily and more productively and respectfully in a diverse world. Not just diversity by race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, those are of course important, but also exposing our students to a diversity of ideas, different ways of doing this, different conceptions of what profit and pro et cetera. We're doing better and better at that as a group, I strongly believe. We're, it's not perfect, but it's moving in my view, clearly in the right direction. So let me just uh, share a little bit about what we're learning about finance classrooms, because I think it's an, an interesting and maybe more complicated domain of change. Dan, you, you did your MBA at Stern, which is a, a, a significant institution, particularly in well known for its programs in finance. And of course it's um, as a, uh, a major provider of talent to Wall Street. Um, you both have studied economics. I think the statistics would say today that um, half of the, of the most uh, well known MBA programs in the country, half of the deans have backgrounds in economics, finance, accounting. The Ideas Worth Teaching Awards um, are part of a broader change strategy in business education, recognizing the importance of business degrees that have really um, began in the 1990s to surpass engineering and law as the kind of degrees of choice for the higher echelons of management. And again, the dominance of that paradigm of business education is clear in the numbers of undergraduates as well as graduate students that continue to choose this as kind of the degree of choice for entry into a career. Um, so I'm kind of curious, Dan, as you think about your own education in economics and then in, in, at, uh, at Stern, and how you think now about the skill set that's needed as you sit in the position of being the CEO. I mean, has your view shifted about talent and, and what the skill set is that we need? Are you, are you, as you kind of position PayPal for growth and embrace the services and payment and credit functions and consider the, some of these complex questions, um, including AI and data privacy and security and, and the incredible work you've done on reaching non-traditional users um, and the kind of hard to bank. Um, you know, can you, can you hire talent out of an MBA program and assume that they're gonna have the attitudes and skills and knowledge that they need to succeed at PayPal and help you grow? Do you think there's a disconnect here? Do you have a, a way to think about this or help us think about it from your, your vantage point? Uh, I think I was counting there, Judah. I think that was 14 questions. 14 um, questions. It could have been. 14 um, seconds. 14 <laughs> questions. Exactly. Well, the one thing I'm very glad you didn't do is ask me an economic theory question um, <laughs> because you know I will have long uh, forgotten um, that that I learned. Um, and I also think um, it's very important that uh, we think about education in time frames as well. For instance, like I can learn about uh, certain functional expertise and theories that are relevant for maybe the next year, year or two, but 
What I would say in financial services is that we are gonna experience more change in the next five years than we experienced in the last 50 to 70 years or so. And so anyone who is teaching about what was and extrapolating forward is going to miss one of these fundamental shifts that are happening right now. Like we have got a, um, a combination of an explosion of mobile phones that will replace distribution channels going forward. We've got quantum computing that will revolutionize the ability for us to use AI. We have more data uh, than we've ever had before in our lives. Um, everything is moving into digital central banks, regulators, companies are rethinking what the financial system will look like uh, going forward. And so I think what I hope is being taught and was not taught to me when I was in business school um, is how to think in an expansive and nonlinear fashion and how to really think about what might be not what was and what can shape that going forward. Because I think, by the way, that's not so much in an entry level job, but as you're talking about moving up into senior leadership, like I am constantly challenging where we are and what our model is and how we uh, into um, uh, the world economy. Uh, going forward. And that idea of, of, of thinking, of uh, discontinuous thinking, I think is incredibly important. Like the average length of a Fortune 500 company now is something like eight to 10 years. You know, 30 years ago it was something like 40 or 50 years. I mean, that's how fast the world is moving. And so I think uh, training around ways of thinking in this world that is moving faster than ever before, that has combinations of not just economic theory, but political theory, um, privacy issues, ethics, um, philosophy that goes into it is incredibly important as you become leaders uh, of companies, um, values-based leadership, these are crucial, and um, you know, I'm very interested to hear from Kerwin how how he's thinking about uh, all of this as well. But um, like I know when I think about the training that I have and where I stand right now, uh, there is a disconnect. And I talk to the Stern School folks who come in almost every year, the entering freshman class, about all the changes going on and what I hope they get out of their education, um, which is different than what uh, I was trained in and, and how I was uh, educated. Kerwin, do you have a, a, um, a brief reaction to that? You talked about it a little bit before yes, I, I get into Dan, and then that'll leave us time to, to get into one more 18 part question before uh, we okay. close. So I, th I think that, so Dan makes a profoundly important point here about about the connection between the training that goes on in schools on the one hand and the, the lived professional business experience, if I may paraphrase. So what is that experience? I hired Judy, PayPal hired Judy. And they say to Judy, you're in charge of whatever thing, and you do it. And the thing over which you're put in charge, Judy, is something you've never seen, something you've never seen. And even if you've seen it before, it will be different tomorrow. That's going to be true for every major leadership position in every firm. Reflecting upon that fundamental fact, a university, a school says to itself, well, how do I best equip Judy to take on these duties that not, are not only different from what she imagines, but will be different from what she currently can imagine, yes, and which she will have to equip herself for as an autodidact. Judy's going to have to learn stuff, yes? on the job. It seems to me that Judy's capacity to function in this hypothetical job will hinge crucially on her open-mindedness, her willingness to be clear about her beliefs, her biases or expectations, yeah? And her willingness to jettison them when they turn out to be inconsistent with the facts that emerge, point one. 
Judy must be able to critically think and evaluate. And I mean this quite seriously, critically think and evaluate, dispassionately and say, here is what I am told PayPal or organizations X values are. This thing being proposed is seemingly consistent with it, but upon reflection, it is not or is or whatever. Judy's got to engage in that kind of critical thinking. And she's got to engage, we know, in collaborative activity. She's got to lead a team. Yeah? She's got to supervise. She's got to be supervised. She's got to work with someone next door, someone across the country. Yeah? Whatever else we do. Whatever, if we expose people to cab M, yeah, or to objective functions in economics or you know, double entry bookkeep, whatever else we do, we have to equip our students for those three things. Open-mindedness, rigorous critical thinking, and a capacity to work in a new and constantly changing collaborative fashion. That guides my thinking in the School of Management. And I believe ought to guide the thinking of other places and probably does. So just piggybacking briefly on what Dan said. Thank you. So I'd like to, I'd like to bring us back to your own leadership um, and end on the question of what we call choice points of leaders. Um, and particularly as it affects this, the national conversation that we're having now on race, precipitated by the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but it's kind of, it's playing out not just in the streets, but in the hallways, uh, in cafeterias, the, at least the virtual cafeterias. So I'd like to ask each of you um, how you think of these challenges we face and your own role and kind of the best, in, the best and highest use of your own voice and role in this moment. Dean Charles, I, I received the letter you sent yesterday um, that all alumni received, uh, detailing the ways in which SOM is gonna take up this conversation of race and some of the changes that you're already foreseeing in curriculum recruitment, uh, both at the faculty and student level. Um, Dan, your company has, as you already used in the stunning example of North Carolina, um, been clear about your values of inclusiveness. But you have so many ways in which you can be influential in the kinds of institutions you lead. So I guess I'm trying to understand in the scope of responsibilities that you have and the choices you have to make, what's the, what is, what's the best and highest use of your, your role? Is this, is this put to me, Either one. Okay. Either so, one, both. And we have maybe five or six minutes. Uh, okay. So I, I would say that um, you are right. We are in this moment when the country and the world indeed, but especially the country, is engaged in reflection and uh, hopefully transformation of systems that have produced uh, seemingly enduring socioeconomic inequalities along racial lines. So that is true. What is the role of a business school? What's the role of business education? What's the role of business? I will speak briefly about, just about my narrow role as the head of a school that is training people and producing research thus and so. We have a moral imperative, it seems to me, to engage with this question seriously. We have a moral imperative. We have an imperative to adjust our training to ensure our instruction, what, our, what subjects we teach, what ideas we expose our students to, the makeup of our classroom yeah, has to reflect the inclusivity and diversity and openness uh, that we all kind of collectively aspire to. But beyond the kind of the moral imperative we, we, we all face to diversify, to be inclusive, to be thoughtful and transformative about the issue of social justice, there's a matter of functionality. Yeah. Remember the hypothetical we just talked through about Judy taking on a job at Company X. Julie will encounter an increasingly uh, diverse set of coworkers and customers. Judy must understand their perspective. Why is it that ideas that seem obvious to her and unhurtful to her are not at all obvious to them or deeply hurtful to them? Yeah. Judy will be a better employer the better exposed and earlier and more deeply exposed she is during her education. 
And so it seems to me from the university or scholars perspective, one thing we are compelled to address is the issue of access. I cannot do the things we just described as a, at an institution, at a school of management, if seated in the classroom yeah, are very few persons of color. Yeah, that would seem to give lie to the very thing I seek to be achieving. And so that is one thing that must be addressed. There is a matter of what and how we teach. Yeah. How do I situate or center, if one uses that term, the issue of racial diversity and inclusion in a class on accounting, what, what, what is, yeah. well, the point is, even if this centering is difficult in a particular class, we must find ways to bring it into the curriculum school-wide so that students understand that if it's not directly obviously pertinent here, there are contexts there, it is generally, it's important to be addressed more generally. And we expose them to these ideas in some capstone class or something in the business school. Finding ways to do that is, uh, I think, essential. You mentioned that there is, uh, there's teaching, I, I, I may have mentioned, that there's teaching on diversity and inclusion and related matters going on already. Those need to be supported and enriched. But there are things that we have not given a lot of thought to. Here's one. I've described the role of university and of my school as producing research and training the next generation of leaders. Do I, do we collectively have an obligation to help address these issues in the communities in which we sit? Yes, I think we do. Yeah. And universities have to find ways to be involved in a manner consistent with our values and our principles. But leaning into that mission and that enterprise, I regard as a fundamental part of our mission going forward. Thank you. Dan, I'll leave it to you to uh, have you close, close out our conversation today as you think about your own role and institution and where you have a role to play here. I think we, I, I fully agree with uh, current current Crewing on so many fronts, I do think we have a, a moral obligation to uh, to stand up um, and to stand up in a very strong way um, for what we believe in, what our values are. I think um, we need to listen uh, very carefully. Um, we need to learn. <clears throat> we need to approach conversations with a uh, with an open heart. Um, because inevitably you always get something wrong, but you should approach it with an open heart. And then I thought for PayPal, we needed to not just condemn racism, but we needed to demonstrate that we were going to be part of the fight for racial equality, uh, especially around reducing the racial wealth gap that Kerwin um, has so eloquently uh, written about and talked about. Um, and so uh, based on talks I had with black leaders across PayPal, black leaders across the country, we decided that we were gonna put $530 million uh, in the fight um, to create some sort of uh, racial wealth equality. And we would do some of that immediately and some of that over the medium and long-term because I think what's really important is that this not be just a moment in time, but this be a movement um, that, um, that we all rise up and hopefully our role is not just to be directly engaged, but to influence others, other CEOs, other leaders, that they should also step up in a very meaningful way because we have not addressed this issue in any meaningful way since the last civil rights movement in 1960. You look at the racial wealth gap, it is the same as it was um, what, some 50 uh, plus years, 60 years ago. And so I think if your highest value is around inclusion and diversity, which it should be for every single company because more diverse companies are more successful 
having diversity of thought strengthens you. It, it's not a nice to do, it's a must do. And so um, I feel like uh, we as CEOs, as deans of prestigious universities, we have a obligation to stand up, to make our voices heard, to uh, uh, push with all of our might on values um, that strengthen our communities, that strengthen our companies, that strengthen our country. Well, with that, uh, as I welcome Jamie back to the screen, um, I just wanna thank the two of you. Thank you for being a part of this conversation and for giving us a lot to think about in the changes that need to happen at the levels of institutions, including our own, the Aspen Institute. And I've been really honored to be able to be a part of this conversation with the two of you and very much appreciate your generous spirit in which you have come to help celebrate uh, some remarkable scholars and in institutions across the country and across the world. We're trying to bring these conversation into the classroom and prepare the next generation of leaders. So with that, thank you both. We're gonna disappear. Jamie's gonna carry on. Please stay on and watch and uh, meet some of these in video. Jamie, over to you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you, Dan and Kerwin. Uh, that was a really important conversation. I don't think we could have chosen any two better people to speak to the, the power of individual choices and the need to examine and personal values and translate that into passion for purpose. Um, I think a number of things said during that conversation point to a new set of skills and frameworks. Dan mentioned nonlinear and expansive thinking. Kerwin mentioned open-mindedness, rigorousness, cooperation. All of that is needed to support a flourishing business and economy, but also society and democracy. Um, Kerwin and Dan are featured here because their leadership stands out and they're unique will need more leadership like theirs um, to become the norm instead of, instead of the exception. Um, and this brings us back to the award winners that we mentioned at the beginning of the call um, with some ex important exceptions. Uh, the business school teaching hasn't changed much over the past 50 years. And with over 700,000 students graduating with business degrees in the US alone, how business is taught remains an important leverage point. So the faculty we're awarding today are doing really extraordinary work. They're teaching complex subjects in an increasingly complex world. Um, and their work is really pushing at the core DNA of management education. They're encouraging a more nuanced view of the purpose of the corporation and more sophisticated measurements of success. So the work that we do at the Aspen Institute through these awards is bring visibility to the faculty leaders to recognize the work that goes into developing and teaching the courses like these, but we also wanna highlight them so that others may learn and inspire creative approaches in more classrooms. Um, I know we've got a number of um, different people on the phone you may be watching as faculty, students, current business leaders, no matter where you sit, these faculty are providing insights into how to make better business choices. So with about 10, 12 minutes left, we'd like to do a little bit of a mini preview of each of these courses and allow for you, the audience members, to meet the winners and get a taste of what makes their courses unique. These, um, we'll call them course trailers, they're only meant to be a sneak preview, um, but we encourage you all to go to ideasforteachingawards.org to learn more about the courses and you can check out the syllabi. Uh, we'll also be providing in-depth interviews and webinars throughout the year and you can find out more about those and um, weekly resources at the intersection of business and society by subscribing to our Ideas for Teaching Digest. Um, links will be posted in the chat shortly. So let's get started. Um, these, these courses all span the globe. Um, they, they hit almost every continent. And so we'll, we'll start from East and work our way West. Um, first up, we'll hear from a, a team talk course. Oh, go back. Uh, from the Auckland University of Technology, Technology Business School. Uh, this is Ethics, Responsibility, and Sustainability, taught by uh, Marjolaine lips Verschma, Peter McGee, Amber Nicholson, and Peter Skilling. Here they are. Kia ora tato. I'm Peter McGee. I'm Amber Nicholson. 
I'm Peter Skilling, and with our colleague Mario Lipsfirschma, we developed the compulsory ERS course for Bachelor of Business students. We integrate Indigenous perspectives on ethics and sustainability, focusing on the worldview of Māori of Aotearoa New Zealand. We challenge students to grapple with how contemporary Western business can engage with and learn from Indigenous wisdom that is more holistic, relational and intergenerational. Our course offers students an important chance to identify and analyse problems inherent in our current ways of doing business and a framework to develop meaningful alternatives. So greetings from us and congratulations to all of the CS winners. Nā mihi. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you to that team. Next we have Future of Work uh, by Siddhartha Saxena. He teaches at Ahmedabad University Emirate Moody School of Management. Hello everyone. My name is Siddhartha Saxena. The course that I teach is Future of Work. My course focuses on technology, work and human side and how it is going to impact the society. It tries to cover some area like gig economy, artificial intelligence, data and how it is having interference with our society right now. Instead of having sequestering quiz based uh, pedagogy, what it has is that the student actually learns the technology and tries to implement it on various projects and takes a lot of field work. It is important for a student who is going to be tomorrow's employee and is going to contribute towards society to understand how they are going to contribute towards the future and what will be the position that they will be holding. Great. Moving our way to the next winner. We've got Organizing in the Time of Crisis, the case of COVID-19. This is a course taught across or developed across multiple universities. Leonard de Bush at the University of Innsbruck and Elke Schusler at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. Here they are. Hi, my name is Elke Schusler. Hi, I'm Leonard Dobusch. Our course is a collaborative effort of management scholars from Austrian and German universities with expertise in researching grand challenges, different forms of organizing and crisis management. Each of its 12 classes comprises a short recorded lecture and a set of core readings which have to be linked to contemporary newspaper articles by the students. The entire course is made available open access for everyone at timesofcrisis.org with lecture slides and the syllabus being shared in editable formats so that instructors from around the world can use the materials and adjust the courses needed. Finally, the website has a blog featuring ongoing updates as well as the best essays contributed by students. A timely course indeed. Next. We have Jean Piero Petrigolari teaching at INSEAD, the course Ethics Value Based Leadership for Cosmopolitans. Here he is to tell you more. Hi, my name is Gian Piero Petriglieri, and I teach Value Based Leadership for Cosmopolitans in the INSEAD MBA program. The course revolves around the questions what does it mean and what does it take to be a good leader in a world in which people more often move around by choice or by necessity and organizations are becoming more diverse? There's been a tendency in that context to reduce leadership to a set of tools you need so that you can get your way and be on your way. But that's a ruthless, narrow and frankly dangerous view of leadership. The course challenges that and invites students to consider the people, the places and principles that they take with them and give them roots as leaders, even as they move around. Great, thank you. Now jumping over to the North American continent, we've got corporate diplomacy, aligning stakeholder analytics and strategy. This is taught by Veet Hinnish at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. Here he is to tell you more. Hi, I'm Veet Hinnish. My course responds to the growing demand from managers, consultants, investors, creditors, and board members to develop strategies that align firms' actions to stakeholder values. It goes beyond the rhetoric of stakeholder management, however, to provide practical tools to measure stakeholders' power and issues of concern, as well as estimate the financial impact of stakeholder cooperation and conflict. It also acknowledges that implementation may be opposed and offers guidance into running communications battles, as well as organizational change initiatives. 
As capitalism continues to grapple with climate change, demands for racial justice, human rights, and good governance, these skills are increasingly demanded by financiers, consulting firms, as well as in the management of firms seeking capital or consulting advice. Thank you, Veet. Four more courses. Next up, we have the 360 degree corporation, which is taught by Sarah Kaplan at the University of Toronto Rotman School of Management. I'm Sarah Kaplan, and the Aspen Institute is recognizing my course, the 360 Corporation. In contrast to the typical B-School course, I don't jump from case to case to discuss different topics about business and society. Instead, I immerse the students in one company, sometimes Walmart or Nike or Amazon, looking at it from all 360 degrees, through the eyes of employees, customers, workers in the supply chain, communities, the environment, governments, and other stakeholders. In doing so, the course highlights the trade-offs between the interests of different stakeholders that emerge. For example, consumers might like next-day delivery from Amazon. Amazon, but it clogs the roads, degrades the environment, and creates precarious jobs. We then focus on what kinds of solutions to these trade-offs might emerge. Recently, I published a book based on the course, The 360 Corporation from Stakeholder Trade-Offs to Transformation, to outline the lessons learned so that managers can identify trade-offs, innovate around them, and even thrive within them. Thanks to Sarah. Next we have... Uh, Impact Studio, Translating Research into Practice. This is taught by Jeffrey Sanchez Burks at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Sanchez Burks, a professor in management organizations at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Thank you for allowing us to be part of this on behalf of the whole team. Our course is really about trying to leverage the expertise in the ivory tower from faculty research from graduate student insights and expertise across the university, harnessing all of those things to actually make a positive difference in the world for local businesses, for nonprofit organizations, and the like. We have real opportunity to help illuminate ways in which anthropology, psychology, sociology have really informed ways to design more preferable futures. Hope you can learn more uh, about the Impact Studio. But just in closing, thank you again. Bye-bye. We've got two more extraordinary courses. Next up, we have resource allocations uh, from Arizona State University College of Integrative Sciences and Arts, taught by Elizabeth Castillo. Here she is. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Castillo. My resource allocation course teaches online undergraduate students to understand the tangible and intangible resources that leaders use to create a sustainable enterprise. Through the lens of capabilities in social accounting, students learn how to develop and integrate multiple forms of capital into a business model. It covers resources that don't show up on a balance sheet, such as people, nature, relationships, knowledge, governance, and ethics. Key takeaways are that resource decisions are in fact values decisions, that resource allocation choices shape power dynamics and structure our society for better or for worse, and that innovation and prosperity depend on an economy rooted in reciprocity. Great. And lastly, certainly not lastly, uh, we have the seminar in business and society, which is taught by Oscar Jerome Stewart at San Francisco State University, the Lamb College of Business. We unfortunately can't play a course trailer from Oscar today, but I'm happy to say a few words about why the award selection committee chose this course. Um, this management course uniquely seeks to dismantle oppressive and exploitative structures and in institutions by introducing concepts such as laboratory consciousness and by equipping students to have very difficult conversations and make decisions that build equitable and socially just organizations. Professor Stewart, he rejects historical norms of business education to help students redefine business success while examining the outsized role that business plays and how equally equal, just, and sustainable our economy can be. So that brings us to the end of today's programming. Um, I'd like to send a heartfelt congratulations to these faculty from the whole Aspen Institute. I know you can only see me and hear me, but there's a whole team behind this who are doing a very loud round of applause right now. Um, and for all of our attendees today, thank you very much for joining and we hope you enjoyed the conversation, maybe learned something. Please go to our website to learn more about the work of these faculty and the work that the Aspen Institute does in business education. 
until next time, I'll see you later. Thank you.